Opinions stated by various contributors to the Money and Business Show and related programs are not to be considered as endorsed by Radio Shalom, its employees, TE Wealth, TE Meradar, TE Financial Consultants, or TE Investment Councils, Inc. Visitors to this program are urged to use their own discernment to draw their own conclusions. Please read your prospectus and consult with your own investment advisor. Live from the studios of Radio Shalom, 1650 AM in Montreal, Canada, the city of Joie de Vivre, the world capital of culinary variety and the home of the Montreal Canadiens. This is the Money and Business Show with your host, Samuel Izerzer, consultant with T.E. Miradal, a national wealth management company answering to all your financial planning needs since 1972, known as T.E. Wealth in the rest of the country and headquartered in Toronto. Every week, Samuel and his guests discuss money, investments, financial services, and the world economy. Over the next hour, you can have your questions about business and personal finances answered. So call 514-738-4100, extension 200, to speak with Samuel and his guests. And now, here is the host of the Money and Business Show, Samuel Izerzer. Money, money, and business, the numerous types of energy possibilities that can derive from the ocean, wave and tidal energy, ocean current energy, offshore wind, salient gradient energy, and ocean thermal gradient energy are examples. Uh, most of the current uh, research and development in Canada and North America concentrate on the wave and tidal current power generation. Wave energy research was pursued intensely during the 1970s and early 1980s in North America. Interest in it was received in the mid-1990s as one of the options to reduce fossil fuel dependency and address global warming. During these last 30 years, a large number of devices such as nodding ducts, submerged pressure chambers, and many others have been tried with varying degrees of success. However, wave technology is now slowly maturing and the day of commercial viability is fast approaching. There are two basic types of wave technology, fixed onshore and floating offshore. Up to very recently, most of the research and development has been focused on fixed devices onshore or in shallow waters. Now, however, there is increasing interest in the much greater offshore resource with a variety of floating devices being developed. Here in Canada, BC Hydro Green Energy study for uh, the British Columbia Phase 1 estimated the future price of wave energy to be in around 4 to 9 cents kilowatts per hour range. According to uh, the World Energy Council, costs uh, are currently in about 12 to 16 cents uh, per kilowatt uh, per range. But again, with ocean energy, with three to five years, electricity can be expected for energy to come down to about five to seven cents range. When we look at the cost and compare them to the conventional technologies, it should be kept in mind that electricity from fossil fuels will only get more expensive in the future as supplies dwindles and also the fossil fuels energy does not include the cost of uh, externalities such as pollution and greenhouse gas emission. Today on the Money Business Show, coming to you live from Indiana Wells, Indian Wells, California, as Mr. Lyons is a founding partner and president of Capital Partners uh, Worldwide, an international capital solutions and financial advisory company, to discuss the advantages of ocean energy and how we can uh, the consumer can have save substantial amount in energy for the future. My name is Samuel Zerzer, your host to the Money Business Show, Radio Shalom, CJRS 1650 AM. Thank you for tuning in live with our business studios, headquarters in Montreal, the financial capital, and the home of the greatest hockey team, the Montreal Canadiens. We have another great show for you today. And as always, uh, you can call if you have any questions, comments, or criticism on today's topic. Please call us direct at 514-738-4100, extension 200, or email me at moneybusinessshow at gmail.com if you have any inquiries. You can also visit our website at www.radio-shalom.ca, and uh, all our shows are archived there. I work as a financial consultant for T.E. Meradal, has been providing corporate executives, CEOs, families, employers and employees with independent wealth management and financial education services since 1972. You can also visit our website for my contact information at www.temeradal.com. Our topic are today is ocean power as a sustainable alternative energy. The storm brought something like 23 serious fires to parts of Staten Island, Brooklyn, Queens, as well as City Island in the Bronx. 
Uh, the terrible fire on Breezy Point is now under control, but we believe we lost more than 80 houses. Uh, the search and recovery operations there are ongoing. If any of you saw the pictures on television, it looked like uh, a uh, forest fire out in the Midwest. The winds were just devastating, blowing from one building to the next one, and those buildings were close together. Uh, we are hoping and praying that there was no loss of life in those fires, but uh, even, we can, uh, even if we can save uh, every life, we know that many people have lost their homes. And I want to know them to know that we have, uh, they have our full support in the days and weeks ahead. That was the uh, New York City Mayor Michael Bloomberg. Gives us a brief update on the horrific fire uh, uh, in the Breezy Point section of uh, New York City. Um, I don't know. I, I'm almost sure that uh, Breezy Point is, uh, I think, is in Queens in New York. And if anybody just Googles Breezy Point, you would understand the devastation. More than 80 homes or even more um, were, were devastated. Um, and uh, it, it's just uh, my heart goes out to uh, the people from New York. So if you are from New York and if you can listen, I, I, I'm not too sure because I actually tried um, to call... Uh, some of the businesses in New York uh, to give us some first-hand in information of what's been happening there and some of the people. I, can, I couldn't even get a line uh, out there, and um, it was very hard. So if you are from New York and if you've been through the devastation, if you want to give me a call at 514-738-4100, extension 200, I have a line just specifically for you if you want to talk a little bit more on, on the fires. Um, and the devastation or how are things going in New York, please uh, give us a call again, 514-738-4100, extension 200, um, and I'd like to hear from you. Also, uh, what I've been hearing, a lot of people on the, on the, on the shore of the uh, New York did not have uh, insurance. I mean, um, I, I couldn't believe it, but I found out that uh, a lot of insurance companies don't insure you there, but the U.S. government does. So if you had um, uh, uh, government insurance or federal uh, government insurance, you were insured and you had to get it 30 days before. One of the positive things today that I, I, I figured that was very important was, um, not, thank God, not that many lives were lost. But also uh, the New York Stock Exchange uh, uh, was open and it was very smart for them for the last two days. And we did not have a crash, as most people said, we're going to have a crash. Uh, the S&P 500 was up maybe barely one point today. And the Dow was maybe down a little bit and uh, oil up a little bit and the Nasdaq uh, maybe down a little bit. And the S&P TSX uh, was up like 83 points. Uh, today, so we did not have a, a major uh, downfall today uh, from the stock market. Thank God. Um, and also, like again, five one four seven three eight four one zero zero extension uh, two hundred uh, for the people uh, from specifically in the New York a area, Atlantic, Jersey Shore. If you're listening, if you're listening, if you have access to uh, to the ra to the radio, uh, please g give us a call. Um, today, I want to. Introduce our guest is uh, Mr. Uh, Lyons uh, has uh, has successfully secured financing for renewable energy projects in 86 countries, uh, with emphasis on long-term equity investment perspective to finance and complete concept to consumer cycle. He has achieved sustainable and uh, breakthrough shareholder value for the next uh, generation energy sources. He has secured the infrastructure funding required to support game-changing technologies for clean alternative energy solutions by establishing public-private partnerships under the Clean Development and Energy Climate Change Public Funding Initiatives. Mr. Lyons has mobilized uh, additional uh, private financing to support projects related to tidal power, offshore wind parks, and uh, tradable green uh, certificates. Mr. Lyons, or uh, David Lyons, has successfully set up and sold six technology intensive companies, co founded the Energy Venture Capital Company, Scotia Capital Corporation, served as chairman of the Atlantic Provinces Chamber of Commerce, and on the board of directors of the Canadian Chamber of Commerce, and the founder and first chairman of the Enterprise Forum. He has uh, a completed 500-plus uh, consulting and due diligence assignment for clients, ranging from stock exchange-listed corporations to small, medium-sized companies throughout the, the energy supply chain. His government and industry association contracts include numerous reports on the impact of uh, free trade agreements in Europe and the Americas on the ocean energy industry. How are you, David? 
I'm doing fine this morning, Sam. I guess it's afternoon to you there in Montreal. Well, We're you... still uh, celebrating a bit of what happened in San Francisco. Yeah, well, you see that uh, championship come to the West Coast. Uh, San Francisco and the, and the park there is a very classy, classy location. But what I want to ask you is, what about those Montreal Canadiens? Are they going to see some ice time this year? I think we will see the uh, ice time for the Montreal Canadiens and the rest of the Hockey League. But um, I don't know what to do anymore. I mean, uh, for the first time, I actually uh, on Saturday night, I actually noticed uh, my wife's uh, earrings. Hey, that's nice. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. I hope she's not listening, by the way. Uh, I understand you can pick up a Zamboni pretty cheap right now. Right, and you miss, <laughs> and you and you. I I know you're a Los Angeles Kings fan. Um, so what do you do with that hockey? I mean, well, are you watching maybe uh, some of the older games, or what do you do? Well, we're still living under the bubble of the uh, of the celebration from last spring, but it's starting to wane. We need to see those fellows hit the ice and start to play some some good games out here on the west coast as well but as you know uh, the weather's a little different here so there are some uh, other sport alternatives for us yeah like basketball or or uh, well not, not baseball anymore but maybe soccer um, golf i don't know about that uh, but let me ask you uh, david uh, concerning the, the the hurricane sandy and and all the devastation how would um floating devices in the ocean and and electrical grid stand up against a hurricane force, you know, of, of a you know, hurricane one or hurricane two, you know, like 100 miles an hour, or 150 mile an hour, you know, uh, uh, wind or power. Can it, can, it, can it withhold that kind of power in the ocean? Uh, very doubtful. I think those devices, given the stage of development they're in and the field testing they've done uh, today, whether it's in Canada or other parts of the world, uh, they just haven't been able to test it against those extreme conditions of wave height and, and wind speed, and that's to do whether you're you're talking about uh, tidal or offshore wind farms. Uh, you know, if you look at the examples of the offshore oil and gas industry, which these ocean energy uh, technologies have to to relate to, and you go back to uh, the hurricane in uh, Katrina in the Gulf of Mexico, a lot of the offshore production platforms in the oil industry and the associated pipeline networks. Uh, had some serious problems. And these ocean wave devices that we're talking about today certainly haven't gone through the rigor or developed the, the designs necessary to cope with some of these extreme conditions. I know. it's, um, But the only thing that I'm, I'm a little bit surprised is actually is the magnitude, the force of, of the wind. Uh, it's just very, very, very strong. But you know what? I have a lot of questions for you on um, on ocean energy and the, and the future. But first, what we're going to do is we're going to go through a commercial, David. Okay? And uh, we're going to be hearing a little... We're back live in studio with Samuel Azuzer in the business headquarters of Radio Shalom, 1650 AM in Montreal, Canada, with the Money and Business Show. Samuel Azuzer is a consultant with T.E. Miradal, which has been providing individuals, families, businesses, and employees with truly objective financial advice and education since 1972. You can visit them at www.teemiradal.com. You have questions about your personal finances? You need advice in making sound financial decisions? Samuel and his guests are ready to take your call at 514-738-4100, extension 200. And now, back to the Money and Business Show. I'm Samuel Zerza for the Money and Business Show, Radio Shalom CJRS 1650 AM Montreal. Today's topic is ocean power, sustainable alternative energy. I'm with uh, David Lyon, who's... Um, who's a founding partner and president of Capital Partners uh, Worldwide. Also, uh, like I said, I, I, um, I want to make a call out there. If you're from New York, I know I had a hard time reaching a New York today. I wanted someone live to talk to me on the, on the situation in New York. So if you're listening and you want to give us a call, 514-738-4100, extension 200. Again, 514-738-4100. 4100 extension 200 I like to hear from you okay also uh, David what is wave energy wave energy is basically using the ocean to uh, and transforming it into a power source that can be used for electricity and what are uh, using, okay uh, uh, if you take a look at the, some of the inland waters or hydro projects you're looking at the flow flow rate and uh, with some of the offshore 
applications in the open ocean. You're looking at uh, differences in, in, in temperature gradients up and down the water column or at wind speeds. Uh, so there's a number of different alternatives for looking at it. Right now, the, probably the most developed one from a commercial point of view is offshore wind power. Uh, and these are from primarily fixed structures near shore that can, uh, where t uh, turbines are installed and collect the wind. It's transmitted through a transmission cable on the seafloor, then hooked up to an electrical grid uh, on land. That's probably the most developed. When it comes to uh, the tidal, and you do have a large tidal project in Canada uh, in Nova Scotia in the Bay of Fundy. I mean, the Bay of Fundy changes 160 billion uh, tons of water each tide change, and that's right, 160 billion tons. So it's a tremendous source when it comes to, to hydropower. Going beyond that, a lot of the development of ocean energy has taken place in uh, the North Sea, uh, the northern North Sea, offshore Scotland and offshore the, uh, England and over into uh, in Norway and Denmark and Holland. Uh, those would be the most advanced in terms of ocean industry projects right now uh, for an alternative to oil and gas. But when you keep that in mind, uh, if we project out to 2035, uh, we're going to see a 40% increase in the, in the demand and consumption for, uh, for energy and it's expected that still 80% of that will be generated from traditional fossil fuels, primarily oil and gas. So this ocean energy alternative renewable kind of scenario represents 15 to 20% over the next uh, uh, next 20 years. So, uh, David, just uh, what are the advantages and um, and disadvantages of alternative uh, tidal power, as I call it, as an energy source? Well, the advantages are you're using a renewable uh, source. Uh, in, in the case of tidal, you're using the, the tide changes, which are going to take place and are, are renewed every every eight hours. As far as offshore wind farms, you're using the other element of, of Mother Nature. So they're renewable. We're not depleting the resource as you are with, with fossil fuels. There's some uh, environmental advantages as well. Uh, there's a lot of talk today about shale gas plays throughout Canada, Western Canada and the United States, and the impact of that on, on groundwater and getting into our potable water supplies. So the ocean energy scenarios or options kind of steer away from that and provide some environmental advantages. On the other hand, most of these devices are installed and set up and used along coastal areas. And one of the challenges for these ocean energy ventures is to get approval to be able to deploy these along the coast because you're looking at uh, competitive use of, of coastal space and that other use is for tourism and do you want to see a, a device bobbing along, a, along the coast as you're sitting on the beach. You also have mean marine transportation considerations and high traffic zones as to whether these devices are going to be in the way or whether their cables will be severed by uh, shipments moving in and out of a particular region. So on one side, there's some environmental advantages. On the other side, uh, there are some uh, disadvantages. So, so we're really okay. talking here about coastal space utilization, and ocean energy devices are one of many that like to uh, cluster in some of these so, high traffic zones. So David, is it, is it expensive to maintain? Is it expensive? Uh, just a lot of these developments of uh, newer technology have not been proven out enough to know what the full costs are. We are extrapolating from some of our experience in the offshore oil and gas industry, and we found for the subsea cables, and you need transmission cables to bring this energy ashore, that 60% of the insurance claims and 80% of the expenditures are on repairing and maintaining subsea cables. So in the case of ocean energy, the court is still out as to what that will be because the experience is there not is not there yet uh, from a commercial side of side of things. I think we have a lot to learn from the uh, the offshore oil and gas industry in putting floating or fixed structures on the on the seafloor uh, through the water column and on the surface. My view is that until oil reaches two hundred dollars a barrel, that these other ocean energy options are not commercially viable. 
unless uh, there's a substantial amount of, of government support, either in terms of grants or tax credits uh, for that particular sector. $200, wow, uh, oil, that's high. And, uh, it is, uh, and oil right now, as you know, if you look at Brent crude, it's about 210. Um, I think we're a long way from reaching that $200 a barrel, but where these other ocean industry devices come into play is if, if there's subsidization to, to yeah, and we're, and we're going to down into a, a yeah. reasonable zone of pricing. And we're going to talk about maybe a little bit later, but uh, let, let me ask you the, the million-dollar question. Can ocean energy sources compete with the offshore oil and gas industry? Not in the short term. Uh, I believe in the longer term, and by longer term I mean over the next 15 to 20 years, I think they will reach a stage of commercialization where we'll know the answer to that question better. The one area where we are seeing some demonstrated uh, bankable, energy revenue is with offshore wind farms and most of that experience is coming from the the North Sea and oil companies are starting to invest in that kind of asset but it's a long way from being a big part of anybody's energy portfolio at this time because I, I my point of view with all this I it may cost money at the beginning it may take 10 years but the vast amount of energy that can be produced by the ocean is, is just substantial amount and cheap. I mean, it's just a, a, just look at the ocean, how large it is compared to land and, and the power it has. Um, so I, I don't understand why this is not, you know, coming on a, a little too quicker uh, than, um, than it is on now because, you know, I, I know the government... Maybe the grants are not just there, or the, um, or, or, or maybe the manpower uh, to, to produce all this, and the money, and the investment, but does the commercial... Well, first of all, the focus in most energy-consuming countries is still on oil and gas, whether it's onshore or offshore. That's for sure. Second of all, the cost of producing alternative ocean energy is still unknown and I do not think it's cheap although the resource is there and it's plentiful and it's it's global uh, is a big difference between putting out a wave rider to generate energy and maintaining it transporting it and connecting it to a grid uh, we're a long way from that and I think you'll find that the investment in energy is still going to focus on oil and gas for uh, the foreseeable future David, uh, we're going to go through a commercial break right now, but first uh, we're going to be hearing a clip from Governor Cuomo uh, in New York State. He, um, he's going to be talking a little bit about the, uh, the impact of the Hurricane uh, Sandy. Again, my name is Samuel Izerza for the Money Ambition on Radio Shalom, CJRS 1650 AM Montreal. We'll be right back in two minutes. We're back live in studio with Samuel Azuzer in the business headquarters of Radio Shalom, 1650 AM in Montreal, Canada, with the Money and Business Show. Samuel Azuzer is a consultant with TE Miradal, which has been providing individuals, families, businesses, and employees with truly objective financial advice and education since 1972. You can visit them at www.teurmiradal.com. You have questions about your personal finances? You need advice in making sound financial decisions? Samuel and his guests are ready to take your call at 514-738-4100, extension 200. And now, back to the Money and Business Show. My name is Samuel Izerzer, your host for the Money Biz Show on Radio Shalom, CJRS 1650 AM. Thank you for tuning in live in our business headquarters in Montreal. And um, like I said, today we're coming to you live from Indian Wells, uh, California. Uh, today uh, we have uh, Mr. Uh, Lyons uh, is a founding partner and president of uh, Capital Partners Worldwide. And today we're talking about ocean power, a, sustain, a sustainable uh, alternative energy. And uh, this is one of the fields that I, I like to know a little bit more. So um, how you doing, David? I'm doing fine, Sam. Great. Um, I just want to just ask you, just, there's, there's a lot more questions, but has there been commercial success with ocean energy? Uh, there definitely has been some commercial success with regard to offshore wind farms, uh, harnessing the, the wind from fixed and floating structures in the sea. And as I mentioned before, a lot of that ex successful experience has come from uh, the North Sea. And they've drawn on a lot of the know-how 
from the offshore oil and gas industry and using offshore platforms in a highly uh, corrosive and harsh environment, uh, which the North Sea demonstrates. And of course, we have similar conditions off both coasts of uh, east and west coasts of, of Canada as well. I have not seen any offshore wind farm proposals for the east coast of Canada, but it certainly represents an area that could uh, take a, a good look at it. If somebody wants to get a hold of you, a little bit more information on ocean energy, uh, where can they find you? The best is to give me a call. Uh, my phone number in California is 310-497-9346. That's a 24-7 number that I use. When you're in the offshore and in the ocean energy business, you tend to work on a 24-7 kind of yeah, scenario. Right. Um, I, I know in your bio, uh, I was reading, you know, you secured infrastructure funding required to support game-changing technologies. What kind of technology are we talking about? The, the clean alternative energy type of solution? Is that what it is? Uh, a lot of it is to do with uh, the use of the oceans and ocean technology to generate power and energy. I think a real opportunity in Canada and, and elsewhere is the development of a real robust supply chain that ties in with some of these ocean energy ventures and ocean energy devices. Uh, since most of it is in the oceans or in the water, there's a lot of subsea technology that uh, Canada has some leading companies in uh, that can be further developed to work with these ocean energy projects. In order for ocean energy to be bankable, You've got to de-risk it, and part of that de-risking is to develop a robust supply chain. So whether you're developing offshore wind turbine blades that are used on, on wind farms or subsea cable assemblies to transmit uh, from the offshore structure to uh, connect to a, a shore-based grid, these represent opportunities throughout the supply chain for companies that are supplying pieces of equipment, uh, systems, and a large part of it, uh, an attractive area in the revenue, is uh, service companies that are using, for example, subsea robotic systems to go down, install, maintain, repair, and inspect some of these structures that are operating, whether they're fixed or floating, off our coasts. So, David, I, I know last time, I think it was, what, six months ago, you were on the show. Um, you, you went to Europe, if I, if I remember. I think it was England, right? The, you, you spoke at a conference. Did anything that uh, came out of that conference for ocean energy? Uh, uh, it sure has. Uh, I've done a number of uh, speaking engagements in Europe since we spoke last, and <clears throat> they're getting to the point where the commercialization is starting to happen, particularly on the offshore wind side. When it comes to... Uh, wave riders, uh, that is still in its infancy, whether you're in Europe or whether you're in Canada or the United States. We certainly have the coastal regions to generate that kind of energy, but uh, it's still what I would consider a prototype field testing stage. Is, is Europe ready, I mean, to, um, to invest? I mean, I know Europe with the financial crisis, but is... is Europe ready to invest in alternative energy? Do they have the, uh, uh, the infrastructure? Do they have the financing now? Uh, what do you see things coming out of uh, uh, Europe? And also what I wanted to know, uh, this is the, this, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the question, is that who's more advanced? Is it Europe or is it North America into the alternative energy field? Well, uh, alternative energy is a broad field. It includes things like uh, solar as well. But if you're looking at ocean energy, I would say that... Uh, Europe is very strong, particularly uh, countries surrounding uh, the North Sea. And China, as we can expect, is coming on as well with their extensive coastline and the need to generate alternative sources of energy because their consumption levels are going up uh, tremendously. I've also seen some very innovative and aggressive technology come out of uh, Brazil. Uh, they have uh, prioritized ocean energy as part of their overall energy grid for the next uh, two decades. The work in the United States and Canada I don't think is at the same level at this point. Uh, when I look at what's happening in Canada, I see a lot of good R&D capability from other ocean industry kind of projects that can be applied to ocean energy. Uh, but we need to get beyond uh, the R&D phase and find the type of funding to attract capital 
And to do that, they've got to show a more commercial kind of compelling proposal so that institutions or individuals will start to invest in that, that commercial phase of ocean energy. Most of the emphasis right now has been a, on, a, on applied R&D, or research and development. So, uh, David, uh, would you agree that according to the World Energy Council, costs are currently around anywhere from 12 to 16 cents Canadian per kilo, kilowatt hour a range, which is more or less the same thing with the U.S. dollar. But within anywhere from five to ten years, they, they, it can be expected to come down any, any, anywhere from five to seven cents per kilowatt hour uh, range when using wave energy or ocean energy technology. Do you agree with that, with the World Energy Council? I believe that's a very unrealistic uh, statement. Uh, I don't think the industry has developed enough and has had commercial success and operating experience in the field to come up with those kinds of, of figures. Uh, as I mentioned before, the costs of operating in an ocean environment and a corrosive environment uh, are high. And the devices have not been in the field long enough to really clarify what those costs are going to be. The experience we've had to date is primarily with offshore wind farms, and we're finding that uh, the cost of working in those harsh marine environments is very high. I mentioned that uh, these devices have to come in uh, under $200 a barrel if and when oil hits that to be commercially viable. The only other way of keeping the cost down at this time is through uh, uh, the, the tax credits and other government incentives uh, for the ocean energy uh, type ventures. This is why I believe the North Sea is, is one of the leaders because they, the government surrounding the North Sea have, uh, have uh, instituted these kind of incentives to get the business going. But to be able to co quote a total cost right now is too premature. So we don't know uh, for sure if, if it'd be, you know, five to seven cents or even could be ten cents. We, we, we don't even know, uh, according to you, uh, according to your opinion, uh, the World Energy yeah, Council. That's, that's certainly my opinion on it, and okay. that's based on trying to commercialize ocean industry devices now for close to 40 years. It's, uh, it's a long stretch from prototype testing uh, to commercial operation. So, uh, David, and when uh, I, you yeah. know, when I mention the supply chain, I, I really feel that there's a lot of opportunities for Canadian companies to participate in supplying uh, a lot of uh, services for that supply chain because that's so important in trying to keep those costs down of operating a device in a harsh marine environment. David, uh, we have maybe one minute left. Uh, what are some of the effects on, on marine life during construction phase? Uh, is, there, is there any of that? Or? What we're talking about is the electrification of our oceans and some of our inland waters. Uh, the impact is on uh, what do these cables do on the seafloor? Do they affect some of the uh, communication that these mammals have? Uh, that's a consideration. You have the construction phase of, of, of tunneling and, and putting in uh, transmission cables. So there's vessels, there's underwater plows that are used. So there's a, a fair amount of chaotic activity on the seafloor during that uh, uh, development and commissioning phase. So yeah, there is an impact on the environment that has to be taken into consideration. What they found, for example, in the Gulf of Mexico is uh, when they put in platforms, and these platforms are left idle for a while, they call idle iron, they have become uh, coral reefs for fish. So there's also an upside to some of these installations offshore. So uh, David, uh, stay on the line. We're going to be going through a commercial. My name is Samuel Ezerzer for the Money and Business Radio Show, CJRS 1650 AM Montreal. If you have any questions, uh, please call us at 514-738-4100 extension 200 uh, we have the last 15 minutes here so if you're from new york please give us a call i'd like to hear from you uh, i know it's hard to get a line out there a lot of things are shut down um, but again 514-738-4100 extension 200 today on the money biz show uh, coming to you uh, live from indian wells california is mr lyons founding partner and president of Capital Partners Worldwide, an international capital solutions and financial advisory company. And our topic of today is ocean power as a sustainable 
alternative energy. How you doing, Dave? I'm still doing fine, Sam. You know, Dave, uh, I know I have a lot more questions, but I, it seems like uh, New York, uh, there is no telephone lines. Uh, we try to reach um, Queens, uh, try to reach uh, Manhattan. Very hard to reach anybody there. Well, things are really down, that's, that's for sure. It's going to creep back up over the next few days, I believe, but uh, communications are pretty tough right now. I know in my business, I deal with the East Coast early in the morning from California, and uh, it's been it's been very quiet. Uh, the last person I had a long conversation was was in a hotel just prior to it hitting the shoreline. So uh, that's where it's at. That's the reality of it for now. Yeah, I know. Uh, and you know, when you start to look at that kind of situation of high winds and and heavy seas, uh, this whole ocean energy business uh, comes into play. You say, well, can we really sustain? Uh, those kinds of conditions and still generate electricity from uh, from these uh, locations. It's it's a big challenge for the industry right now. It, it's a big challenge also. Uh, but uh, j just your frank opinion. I, I I want to maybe a little bit off topic, but you know the storm can hit about fifty billion dollars. But you know there's going to be reconstruction, and uh, in my opinion, I feel that uh, it can boost the economic growth here in the U.S. Definitely, it's a redevelopment kind of effort, and I think there's room for optimism and opportunity uh, within that region, and uh, the ripple effect goes uh, throughout the country and into Canada and other places where you're sourcing equipment, materials, and, and new technology, whether it's for uh, an underground subway system, a mass transit system, or, you know, it goes right through the economy. So... Uh, Overall, uh, David, let's go back to the uh, to our original subject, the the, the ocean power. Um, uh, what expertise uh, needs to be in place for ocean power or energy to prosper here in Canada? Uh, we have the research facilities and institutes uh, for early development, applied research, and some of the field testing. I believe that there's a need to gain the confidence of the investment community by developing the, the business management side of bringing those ocean energy devices to market. Uh, from my point of view, capital follows sales, not concepts. And right now we're dealing primarily with concepts. So the challenge I see there, what needs to be brought to the table, is the ability to successfully commercialize these devices and, and technologies. And that's where the real challenge is in Canada, to be able to put together a very compelling business proposal to attract capital. How, how is business in Canada, when you come here and you talk about uh, uh, energy power or ocean energy, uh, is it receptive here in Canada? I mean. Well, Canada's always had a strong international uh, knowledge base when it comes to ocean technologies in general. Uh, there's some very renowned ocean institutes. There's some tremendous success across the country and uh, small to medium-sized companies that have developed niche technology in Newfoundland, in Nova Scotia, and Ontario, and in British Columbia. Uh, and I think there's an opportunity for some of those companies to expand and diversify into this ocean energy part of the marketplace. So, David, the, the, the history of the, well, okay, let me go back. The history of the development of wave energy technology clearly shows that the government support is extremely necessary. Uh, when such support stops uh, or abruptly stops, te technological uh, advances also stops or at least slows down dramatically. My question to you, David, is uh, how important and necessary is government support at this stage? I think government support is essential at this early high-risk uh, applied R&D phase. Uh, and it's not always in terms of money, but in terms of facilities. There are tremendous facilities across the country for doing a lot of testing, evaluations in a controlled environment before they're deployed in the open sea. I think those should be brought to the table and offered to companies that are very attractive 
uh, rate. Uh, I believe there needs to be uh, uh, an entrepreneurial attitude that's fostered and recognized because that is where these real inventions are going to, where the rubber is going to hit the road, so to speak. That is an area I think that uh, needs to be further developed. How are we going to compete, or how is, is ocean energy going to compete with, with the offshore oil and gas um, industry? Well, the, the oil and gas industry uh, for many decades into the future still will be the primary source of energy. Uh, up till 2035, still 80% will be generated from fossil fuels. That remaining 20% will be a, a real mix of alternative energy, including solar, wind, and, and ocean energies. Uh, and Canada is in a, in a position where it has a, a number of natural resources uh, to draw on, but it also has uh, a developed East Coast oil and gas industry with Newfoundland and Nova Scotia. And those sources of energy are still going to be very important in the energy mix for the foreseeable future. We have uh, maybe a couple of minutes left, uh, David. Uh, is there anything else that you want to tell our listeners, you know, for or the ocean energy? Uh, is there going to be a conference that you're going to be coming here to Montreal, Toronto, Canada, uh, or Europe that they may want to follow? Well, it's interesting. A lot of my future talks are, are going to be given in Europe and in Asia, Southeast Asia, Asia Pacific. I'll be doing one in Beijing uh, the end of November and it ties in with this subject and I think that demonstrates where the audience is and where the money is flowing in terms of developing ocean energy devices and ocean energy uh, scenarios. David, um, do we have hope for the uh, Los Angeles Kings and the Montreal Canadiens to play and you're going to come down to Montreal and watch the game? Love to. Yeah. I always like to see that L.A. Montreal uh, battle. It's, it's a good one, and you know, if you look at where the L.A. Kings uh, have got a lot of their talent in the past, it's come through the Montreal Canadiens system. Names like uh, Rogi Vachon, for example, come to mind. That's right, and um, you know, lately we've I've been watching some of the uh, older hockey games. Um, one of them that I really wanted to watch, I don't know if you know about this game, is the um, is when the Russians came to uh, Philadelphia. Remember, I don't, do you remember that game? Uh, and and they and they left the ice. Do you recall that game? Well, or? <laughs> well, I do remember. Some of the officiating was in question, and the uh, uh, the, the, the tactics that the Canadians uh, used that the Russians weren't used to. But I think reality has kicked in for the Russians since then. That's right. Good. So, uh, right. David Lyon, thank you very much. He's a founding partner and president of Capital Partners Worldwide, an international capital solution and financial advisory company. Thank you again. You'll come on again. We'll talk about other sources of energy, right? I look forward to it, Sam. Great. Thank you. And again, my name is Samuel Izerzer for the Money in Bishno Radio Shalom, CJRS 1650 AM in Montreal. Happy capitalism and God bless you all. Opinions stated by various contributors to the Money in Business Show and related programs are not to be considered as endorsed by Radio Shalom, its employees, TE Wealth, TE Meradar, TE Financial Consultants, or TE Investment Councils, Inc. Visitors to this program are urged to use their own discernment to draw their own conclusions. Please read your prospectus and consult with your own investment advisor. Shalom AM, Money in Business. Sam and Zerzo, let's get him. <laughs> oh. It won't be long before that money hits you. You reach a certain point where that money is an issue. Yeah. Tax cut inflation, learn about investment. Shoot another perfect show that can help them. Shalom and I'll be tuning in live. Right. Sam and Zerzer, got the advice for you and I. Kick your feet up, listen to the speaker. Got questions, no sweat, take that number. Take it's it. real easy, it's 514-738-4100. Uh -huh. right. Get connected, hit that extension at 200. Money in business, yeah. let's talk cash. Let's Let's talk money, certain ways that we can improve the economy. Take the bites, kid, it's real sacred.